Bah, je vais vous laisser parler de ce qui vous laisse la parole pour vous présenter à la fois voilà, le travail de l'artiste et, 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 et vous avez un, un, un petit endroit ici, un petit stand pour, pour, pour faire la démonstration de cette, avec un masque de réalité virtuelle de ce, ce travail-là. Karen Lévy, euh, fondatrice de Théâtre de Saint-Juy, euh, collectionneuse et passionnée quand même depuis longtemps maintenant à la fois digitale et de réalité euh, virtuelle, euh, avec dans la collection de travail de Niaoui, représentée par Made in Gallery, euh, qui expose euh, ici. Je vous invite aussi à faire l'expérience vraiment de, euh, de, cette, de ce travail-là euh, euh, avec euh, le masque et vous pouvez voir aussi un, un aperçu du travail en 2D tout de même sur, sur écran. Conversation euh, animée par Sylvain Lévy. Euh, co-fondateur avec Dominique Lévy de euh, la collection euh, euh, DSL, euh, hyper pionnier euh, dans le digital, dans la, la monstration de la collection euh, euh, grâce au, 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 au digital, euh, un accès au plus grand nombre, et vous allez aussi euh, peut-être en parler une seconde, et puis euh, dans le, le à la fois l'impression 3D et, euh, et, et, et là, euh, la réalité virtuelle. Donc, je suis particulièrement euh, heureuse et d'aborder cette thématique cette année, puisque c'est vraiment une thématique qui me met chère dans le contexte des jeunes là. Et avec vous trois, les artistes sont absents. Euh, Eric Cassanti, qui est, le, 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 qui est euh, éditeur en chef du magazine Chicha, qui était annoncé. Euh, et qui a fondé, euh, Fischer a fondé le premier, euh, premier festival de réalité virtuelle à Arles. Euh, vous prie de, de l'excuser, il est souffrant aujourd'hui. Euh, mais euh, voilà, je propose en tout cas qu'avec l'expérience de nos trois intervenants et la modération de Sylvain, on évoque largement le travail des artistes. Merci. Merci Alexandra, je dirais, euh, je suis hyper néophyte en tant que modérateur. Uh, uh, we speak English and French. Oh, everybody speaks English. We can speak English. It's okay. So we'll move to English because it's easier because some people do not speak French. First, thank you very much for, for coming. Thank you very much for uh, Alexandra to host this, uh, and you said the right world conversation. I hope that uh, you will be interacting and not just asking questions, but interacting. I think that uh, today uh, everybody speaks of virtual reality. I think it's became a kind of uh, buzzword. Uh, we don't see, we don't know exactly what is virtual reality. It's plus virtual, plus reality. And we try perhaps to try to look a little bit deeper in the art world. What does it mean to work, to work virtual reality? And uh, uh, I think that uh, I, I would like to, 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 to speak of three things for me, which are for me uh, important as, I shall say, a, a challenge for virtual reality. First, it will be about virtual reality opening new spaces to interact with us. The second thing would be something that uh, somehow uh, will, uh, will really give us a lot of details on virtual reality as a new medium for the artist. But also, I would like also to put something perhaps out of, out of the frame on this table. It's about virtual reality, perhaps a way to, uh, I shall say, to solve a huge problem today in the art world is the financing of the model of the art world. Today, uh, there is no museum, there is we know many galleries, nobody is really today having the right model uh, to find the right financial model to survive or to sustain on the long term. And perhaps I will put this on the table and ask our two uh, speakers, and perhaps Uh, we could find through virtual reality, and I say virtual reality means digital, uh, 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 digital distribution, perhaps a new way in the future to solve this problem. But it will be the last 
part of this uh, this uh, uh, small talk. Just uh, and uh, to begin, I, I would like to, uh, to just to tell you the context and perhaps to give you two or three things which are interesting before entering into the, the debate. Uh, which are for me uh, interesting is the context in which we are we speak of virtual reality. Uh, first, uh, you should remember this person, Joan Lanier. Joan Lanier is a pioneer in real virtual reality. He is coined as the person who invented the word virtual reality. And he began to work on virtual reality in the 90s, and this was the first virtual reality installment that he had uh, material that he has done in the 90s. And just I really encourage you to look at this person. The other thing which is important I want is to put the context of virtual reality into the fourth industrial revolution. Sorry. I think that uh, the fourth industrial revolution will change the human being. And uh, this is the complexity of the uh, sorry. This is the complexity of what is the virtual reality, the fourth industrial revolution, and you see that virtual reality is just a small part of it. So let us go into what I would like to discuss now, is uh, the, uh, the virtual reality as a new space. First, uh, if we look what happened in the next, in the last 10 years, 15 years, you see a huge, I should say, uh, new types of experience being uh, open, and especially in the digital world. Yeah. And uh, you, you've been in the art world for a long time. How did you, uh, you saw this uh, new spaces being open, and how did you get to be interested in virtual reality? Well, thank you very much, firstly, Sivan, for the introduction, and it's great to, to be here and to take part in Asia now. And going to answer swiftly your question, um, I have worked in, in the art world and, and was originally not actually a very technological person, and I, like you, have been uh, interested in this uh, uh, direction for a very long time. So I worked with, uh, I don't know, with an auction house at Christie's for many years, and then in a big art fair in Russia, so really with, with art which was more physical, and of course, you know, video art and uh, performance, but um, virtual reality was something which I started to hear about, and then um, my partners, now partners and friends, Jens Fauskau and his wife, um, gave me a call one day and said, oh, we had this brilliant idea, which actually came through one of the artists with whom we produced a work with, Christine Lemmitz. It was uh, initially actually came from the artist himself, who said uh, already about three years ago, so a year in advance of us founding Core Contemporary, that if there's one thing that he would dream to do, would be to produce or to create a work in virtual reality. Um, and it was still something which was practically unheard of at the time uh, in, in the art world, in the art market. And then, in fact, we met um, two of our other partners who had been working in virtual reality, but not in the art world. They had been working uh, in Copenhagen or something really different. So this is how it came to me. And I thought, you know what, I actually, now every time I want to, to see what's happening in the future and to my children, and both VR and technology is something which our kids, the young generation, is looking at. And I thought, hang on a second, this has to be the future. That's how I came to for a contemporary to Jens's idea. So that's how it started. So it started from the artist, not from virtual reality being the new space where you can connect with, with whatever, with art. It's just for you the beginning was Absolutely, and it's interesting because for Cora Contemporary, the artist is still at the center of the whole process. So the idea came from Kristen being the artist, and now actually for us, in the way we differentiate ourselves from anybody else out there producing virtual reality is that the artist is always and remains at the core of the whole process. Yeah, 
Can you went to first reality, not to opposite. Uh, you went to virtual reality to uh, the idea of uh, this uh, new way to connect with people and, uh, and especially to open a museum. And, and uh, so uh, you are part of uh, this, uh, I should say, project of opening a uh, virtual reality museum. And uh, so you, you, you have been in the art world for a certain number of time. Do you feel that uh, virtual reality uh, is really a game changer in, uh, in these new types of experiences in which we are already uh, inside, but we will add to the future, especially the virtual reality or the ground of the You think it's something very different? Very powerful. Well, I think um, uh, I think uh, actually um, so DSL collection, which is a, a family uh, collection, only focused on Chinese contemporary art, that started 15 years ago uh, by my parents, my favorite friends here, uh, Sylvain and Dominic Levy. Uh, the name is DSL collection, uh, which is a generic name also because. You know, since the beginning, just to give you uh, the, the collection, um, it uh, was something that um, we wanted to be uh, continuing in time. Uh, and as we discovered virtual reality, but first, actually, uh, since the beginning, the collection started uh, with the digital, going from a website, uh, going to uh, 2D, 3D, and virtual reality two years ago. Uh, it was, I think, very um, uh, natural in, in a way because um, you know when you collect uh, in, in the collection, we have uh, paintings, installations, uh, videos, so all kinds of mediums. Uh, it's difficult to to ship first, uh, as I would say, that like, practical idea of the collection was to to show the works um, through the, the virtual reality. Uh, as uh, as uh, connecting and sharing it with more people. Uh, so since two years, we've been uh, uh, showing the, the, the virtual reality um, in different locations, different places. Uh, we uh, showed it to actually I think now thousands of people uh, with like between art fairs, um, uh, corporate spaces. So we've been very trying to connect with people rather than people coming uh, to see the collection because I think that's uh, also one of the ideas of the collection is to share it uh, and, and in that sense virtual reality was uh, uh, extremely uh, accessible and, uh, and, uh, and uh, for the people to, to see the collection Interesting and uh, uh, why we went into virtual reality a part of the fact that uh, we've been surfing on the digital too since 2005. What was, uh, for us, the reason why we think that virtual reality is being changed? Because since today, we are always looking at the screen. With virtual reality, is about being immersed and interactive. And with virtual reality, you don't have any physical constraint. This makes the difference between looking at something or being inside something. Sandra, do you think that artists are going to use, as I say, these particularities of virtual reality, or they will try to produce in the same way, but just, as I shall say, the the medium uh, will be a little bit different. Or do you think that they really want to go into creativity or they just want to uh, translate into something new uh, what is the old way to do it? Well, it's an interesting question because um, somebody actually, after having watched uh, all the seven works that we made, was asking themselves or asking us a question, which one of the artists 
um, as you said, just extended their practice into VR and which one of them created something completely new. And it was interesting because it came from an architect. Because as an architect, they were seeing something in a completely different way because virtual reality would be some, uh, another space for them. But I think for the artists so far, with the artists that we work with, they've definitely embraced the medium and jumped on the opportunity to create something completely new, yet you really see the footprint of the artist. So, which I think in my view is also quite interesting because it continues the whole urn of the artist. So you would have, for example, let's take Paul McCarthy, who was one of the first artists which we uh, launched for a contemporary with the Venice Biennale almost two years ago. You know, Paul is a multidisciplinary, as we know, he works in sculpture and drawing and film and um, and the VR piece that he, that he did with us actually combines all of those different media and it even looks like some sort of very interesting new form of sculpture that, that he created. I don't know if any of you had a chance to, to see the, the piece, form of this piece. But you do, once you're in it, it's extremely intense and there's no mistake to be made, it is 100% Paul McCarthy. And some of the artists that we worked with in Yu Hong, if you have a chance, and if you haven't seen it yet here at Asia Now, she's a painter, as, uh, as we all know. And of course, the painterly qualities have been transferred into the VR piece. So, well, it's still, I think, to see how the artists are going to use it. And you know, many of the artists, actually all of the artists that we've worked with so far, have not worked in digital and have not worked in VR. And core contemporary, you know, we are like their hands, where they, where they provide all the tools for them to to use VR as a new medium. And I think maybe there is still a certain amount of maybe shyness on the part of the artists in exploring this medium. So well, I think we're just at the beginning, <laughs> which is great. <laughs> well, I think uh, really definitely the, the artists, I mean, when. Uh, you see the work also from uh, uh, that is shown at Asia now of Hugh Hong, and uh, we we're showing Miao Ying actually uh, uh, first work that uh, we collected one of the first uh, in virtual reality um, that are very different <laughs> because one is uh, actually a, a painter and the other one is using the visual art as well as the videos um, uh, to have created the, the, her work. Um, it's it's really interesting. It's um, it, and I think for people it's a real discovery and it's uh, another experience, as you can say, in the art. Um, and actually, children that came and they were only like four or five years old were trying it and stayed for fifteen minutes, uh, like five, uh, six minutes, worse than a bit longer with you. So. Uh, <laughs> So I can, I, I can definitely see that uh, it attracts uh, a broad wide of um, different age and, and different uh, uh, people in this technology. One of the, uh, the things that uh, people say against virtual reality is this, it is because it's a solitary experience. Uh, and art is everything but not a solitary experience. You know, uh, whatever you do now is for sharing, sharing as much as you can. But I will give you my answer for that. But I, I want to be right. Uh, so, uh, do you think that the fact that uh, at this moment, uh, because uh, uh, also people are working on, uh, I shall say, uh, virtual reality, uh, which can be shared by, uh, uh, by many people, but do you think that today the fact that the network is made? by an artist, and it can be only experienced in a solitary way, is it, is it something which could be a, 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 a barrier for, uh, I shall say, the, uh, the development of, uh, of this new tool? Well, I think it's the only form of art which is un-Instagrammable, which makes it cool immediately. <laughs> In my view, because I think that now you know you, you feel that you almost don't have to go to an art fair. People show you everything on the Instagram, so you look at somebody Inst somebody's Instagram and you think, oh well, I don't even have to go there. So, on the one hand, I agree with you that it's a solitary experience, and the only way 
you can relay what you're seeing verbally, which doesn't never actually uh, reflects the truth what you see in the in the in the headset. You know, you have to see it, which has its positive um, sides because, for example, it attracts when it comes to a museum, it attracts visitors. You have to go, you have to see it. And also, like with a piece of uh, flat art or sculpture, you have to see it several times to be able to see all the facets and to have, I think every time you have a different experience, you know, with your work that you have here as well, I think every time you watch it, you would have a totally different experience. So, I think it's, it's great because it also takes people out of their uh, digital comfort zone which we now are so used to, you know, always being able to take an image and share it. Um, but of course, once the experience will be free to be shared with more people, it, uh, it will be much easier to access. And I know, for example, for art fairs, we've had this, this um, question when we did a fair in uh, San Francisco, that you know, their desire was to be able to show it in a space where several people, hundreds of people, can watch it like a screening which of course is still not possible. So there are shortcomings, but I also think it, it, it gives this new energy to the way we view art. It's something pretty different. Can I tell you what answer I give to this kind of question? <laughs> what? I say that when you read a book, you read it alone. So you can also experience VR. Yes. And I think mean? that there are millions of people who are still reading books, not in a group, but alone. So I think it also, could also be uh, you know, a, a, a solitary but very, very also very enriching experience. And you don't have to be always in a crowd to be happy. Yeah. <laughs> so this is uh, what I'm trying to do is to answer this kind of, <laughs> of question. The video, the video that, that's very good. <laughs> oh, I will give you another, another, uh, another thing that people tell me and I'll get back to my answer. Uh, people say, oh, VR, you know, you need me to have a mask uh, to, to use it. Do you think that the fact that having a mask is something which is also a, a kind of uh, by, by, uh, the use of, uh, of uh, VR? I think that when people haven't done it before, of course, there is a certain there was a certain fear. But I think we're already now two years into, for example, core contemporary, and I think it, it has been I would say two years since VR has really been used, and we had the Tate, which used VR in the Modigliani show. So I think there was this fear. I remember we had that in Venice, and where people were afraid and would actually walk around, with ten meters around the headset, not to pick it up. But I think now. It's something which people got used to, uh, and I think some people even own a headset at home. And with the technological development, now that you already have integrated headphones, it makes it much easier. It's not so fiddly. You really can put it on uh, easier, and uh, I think it, we're moving away from that. It's just like a phone. I think we've been through that. Ten years ago, when the iPhone was a new thing, I think we struggled with how to swipe with our fingers, but I think now it's so integrated into our life. And I think this is also why we are, you know, we're so strongly believe in what we do in Coro Contemporary, because we feel that VR and the headsets will become just as a, big, as a part of our life as our phones, as dangerous or <laughs> great as it might be. What do you think, Karen? Well, I think it's, a, it's, it's completely uh, true. <laughs> and uh, that's what we see also with, uh, with our uh, uh, showing the VR, um, either the, the DSL collection, uh, a, a museum in virtual reality that was created actually uh, two years ago. Uh, and, uh, you know, people are kind of like walking, they, they now uh, are um, feeling more and more comfortable when they try it. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, it's just the first step of using the mask. Um, and uh, and what you're gonna discover also because I think also people don't know what to expect they don't know what to what they're gonna see and, uh, and that's kind of like what you might not see with like just looking at an artwork is the experience and the excitement of what you're gonna uh, surprise. I think that once again you know very practical. Uh, you know, very, uh, I just said that I'm sorry. I think of the 
You know, if I want to go under the sea, I have to put a mask. If I want to go into the, into the earth, I have to put a mask. So if I want to teleport myself to another world, why not to be something to go there? Uh, but I think that uh, what will happen, I'm sure, is that uh, the hardware we get with the will be friend or a friend. This is absolutely sure. Uh, but I think that uh, the fact that we have to do to put something to, to go to go to something different, very different from where we are, is still the difference between our augmented reality and VR. Augmented reality is the same same space, uh, just more information. With VR, is really being in another world. And it's very important, this idea of being in another world. It's very, very important for me. For me. And uh, we'll, we'll see why. Coming uh, to, uh, back to the space, I think that uh, what, uh, what, I've, what we have seen, and Karen will we also tell us, is that uh, I think that with VR, we can widen audience of art. And uh, I will give two examples and uh, you will confirm me uh, uh, if it's true or not. Uh, first, the old people, the retirement, the, the old people who cannot move anymore. Imagine that tomorrow with a mask, you will be capable to go to see an exhibition in Shanghai, in New York, Paris, wherever. They will be capable to go in a concert hall with a 360 uh, uh, view and sound. Don't you think that this already changed the life of the people? The other one, I think, audience which is for me very interesting is the young people. Young people are not interested by art. You cannot bring them into a museum. But if you put them into a VR museum, it's like a game for them. They play video. They play inside, and uh, you will confirm me what is your uh, your experience. But from my point of view, it has it has the potential to come usually usually increase the audience of all. What do you think? I, I completely agree with you, and I think we also had had a very um, uh, great example, physical example of this, because we had shown. Um, in, uh, in Leipzig, um, at the Contemporary Museum, Paul McCarthy and Christine Levitz, their work in VR as well as their physical work. And the number of visitors, the museum, once the exhibition closed, the museum reported to us the number of visitors that they've had. They had an unprecedented number of visitors because of the VR. And, interestingly enough, the age range of the visitors was extremely broad. And they, they saw uh, a great number of young visitors. And I think this is also such a great thing with virtual reality that you can introduce contemporary artists to um, young people who normally have no connection with art. But they all are interested in technology, they're interested in virtual reality. And it is a great way to, to get them into museums. And I also think you know, then it gives them that impetus to learn about the artist. So, you know, they watch the VR, they're attracted by the technology, but then they actually read the text and come back. And I think what you said, it's also interesting because when you put on the headset for the first time, like we all did at some stage, it is quite disconcerting and you feel, you know, that you're out of your comfort zone. But you keep coming back because you constantly can see more and more from an artwork. So it never gets boring. So it's, it's something where also we saw people come back two times, three times to the exhibition to experience the, the, the work and to show it to their friends and they bring friends with them. So absolutely, I think it's for museums, for institutions, I think it's a, a fantastic way to attract the visitors that they're lacking. And it's a problem as we know now in many museums. And Karen, did you have this experience? What experience did you have with the old people and the, and the students since you were and there are people since you've shown it in, in many different places. Well, we had, a, I would say, very good experiences uh, in general. Uh, some people at the beginning were feeling a bit uncomfortable, as you said, and some people came back to try it again, uh, which was interesting. Uh, just to give you another example, we have the work we're showing at Asia now of uh, Miao Yin, 
the work of a young uh, Chinese uh, artist. Uh, we uh, co-commissioned the work we've actually made in gallery, the artist and Art Night London, who started, uh, actually came to us with this idea, uh, if we wanted to, to co-commission the work. Uh, Art Night is a, um, like Louis Blanche in Paris, uh, which attracted a thousand of visitors uh, in different locations in uh, London. Uh, partnering with the institutions. And it was the first time actually they were showing a virtual reality artwork which was displayed in a kind of like a real um, living flat because it was in partnership with a real estate development company. So people were actually sitting in different uh, rooms, in, in the living room. And, uh, that was actually interesting. Uh, and um, people were queuing till 4 in the morning. So that you know, give you again the, 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 the idea that since it's first virtual reality, it's new and people want to try it. But the second aspect of it is also the experience you can you can have with, uh, with virtual reality. I think that uh, what you said both is uh, is important because uh, virtual reality is something new and people are act attracted by whatever is new. But mm, the the real challenge will be the content. Because once the world is read, it's going to be more disseminated. What will make the difference is the content. And I think that uh, what Cora is doing in terms of content uh, is something very, very important. Because uh, it's not just about keeping or racing the car, it's really about bringing artists to use their talents by using a medium. But what is important is the art. It brings me to something uh, which is something very important for me. Uh, uh, and I just said in the beginning, is about the idea of uh, how perhaps can uh, virtual reality become uh, one of the solutions of uh, making uh, the art model, the, the museum model, uh, sustainable. There is no museum who can also who, who say today that they can sustain by themselves. All the museums today are funded or are supported by patrons. And it's a real problem. You cannot, on the long term, have an industry which cannot find by itself a way to survive. And I think it's a real problem, especially in a time where funds are getting down, uh, patrons are less and less putting money because they put money in their own museums. It's a way to find solutions if we want the artists and the if we look at what happening around us, and let's go to uh, to put let's put uh, I should say art into the leisure industry because art is becoming part of the leisure industry. What we saw and what we see is that uh, most of the leisure industries have been impacted by the digital distribution. You have the music or the streaming, you have the cinema or the film, you have Netflix, whatever. You have the uh, newspapers, the books, all has been totally impact. And from all, you have revenues which are now generated by this distribution, of, by, I should say, by uh, this uh, digital distribution. And I will ask you a question because at a certain time, you have to choose a model. Either you choose the model of, I shall say, small editions, like it's used today in terms of videos, in terms of photography, whatever. Either you decide that uh, instead of choosing this model for VR, once the head instead of being quite simulated, you say, okay, we will choose a model where we try to, like for the books, like for the films, we put a price low price, but we try to reach much, much more people. And what is for you the, the model that you think in the future will be uh, uh, the, the right model for that? Well, my answer actually is, would be to have both. I mean, it's something which we discuss quite a lot. And I mean, Cora Contemporary was founded actually with the idea that um, virtual reality will be the new medium and it will be treated like, as you said, video art. 
with relatively small additions and artist proofs. Um, and at the moment, that's what we have been doing. So there have been additions between three and, and ten of each of the works that we've done. And because at the moment there's a great focus on institutions and on virtual reality being integrated into as many institutional shows. However, I think in two, three years' time, I don't know how long it will take, but not so long, uh, when the headsets are integrated, this sort of pay preview model is also a great one because then you will be able to share contemporary art with many more people. At the moment, there is a problem of quality because if we want to show art at the high quality as we do now when we, we do institutions, you can't use it on a portable, do it on a portable headset. You need to have you know, HTC Vive with the, with the uh, sensors and then you really get that immersive experience. Um, so, there, I think there will be these two models that will work you know, in parallel, but I think we definitely have to approach the sharing model. And interestingly enough, it also depends on the artist, because we already are speaking to some artists who, from the beginning, their wish is that their work is shared, or can be shared, quite inexpensively to more people, that it's not seen as something very precious and just for the, you know, big international collectors. So some of the artists actually are interested in VR as a medium to share it with as many people and also to reach out to the young people who don't normally look at their artworks. So I think the second model of sharing will grow and become extremely important in the next few years. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, I think something for me, uh, I would like art to be much more democratized. Uh, I think that today art, uh, the image of art today is linked to a certain number of cliché, which makes art a little bit not as uh, popular as uh, we, should, uh, we should wish. And I think that VR could be uh, the ideal uh, tool to do something like this. Uh, but we have to, to go a little bit further in the way we want to think and the way the artists want to think their uh, you know, the, 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 the artworks. But I think it's very interesting because um, uh, what you are doing with the VSL collection and putting it into virtual reality that essentially everyone in any point of the world, whether it be uh, you know, in Asia or somewhere in Africa, or can view through a headset your collection and have this opportunity, being far away, to get in contact and to learn about art. And I think it also has great educational benefits. So for example, if you have um, areas in the world which don't have access, where people cannot travel, you know, be it in you know, impoverished nations, you can access children and youth and give them an opportunity to learn about contemporary artists. And it's interesting because I also um, there is a, there was a project, a charity project like this, which works in Afghanistan and uh, you know in, in um, uh, South Africa with you know poor children in schools. And we're very interested actually to use VR to enable the children to learn about contemporary art through virtual reality because we know that they will probably never be able to travel. And it also gives them access to artists and to private collections, not only big museums. So I think this is absolutely where we should focus on for the future. Before, sorry, before opening the questions, if there are questions, I would like uh, perhaps to, uh, to give you an advice. Uh, I encourage you to collect VR works. And especially in the world. I will tell you why. Because the words of today will be part of the history of the art. It's the beginning of the artist using the art, and we have great artists using the art for a very small price compared to the price of, of the works of the artist in paintings, whatever. And uh, I think we are in the beginning of uh, the art, and the works today are and some of the words will be part of the history of art, I think, uh, in the next 20 or 30, 30 years. So I think that uh, VR is, uh, is also to be seen as an artwork and also to be collected because I think it's, uh, it's also something which is meaningful.
you have to record that it's historical quote. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's historical, but it's my, it's my view. Uh, so, uh, any question? education to the staff of the museum and it's uh, very hard to make make it uh, happen inside the exhibition space. Do you deal with formation or do you sell their artwork with the notice or if I may answer I think it's actually the the easiest <laughs> way to install an artwork and the cheapest. You don't have Millions of insurance, you know, we all don't want to know what the Picasso show has cost here. Yeah, but I mean, VR, that's also the great thing. It is democratic per se, because all you need is the equipment, and essentially, the, for example, for some of the works that we have, you need 3x3 three three to 4x4 four four square meters for the um, visitor to be able to see the work. And then you can have 10 booths divided by curtains. So it can be done very, very easily. And you know, we've done the shows uh, in, in several museums now, in, in you know, private institutions as well as, uh, as uh, uh, museums. And it's been very, very easy. And, I, and all you need to operate the, the, uh, the artwork is to press a button. And of course, it is technology, and we know technology sometimes has glitches, but as with everything else, it, something which uh, which improves with time it already has but it's it's extremely easy and i think for every museum of the future it would be great to have a vr room and i know that there are some museums and found private foundations that are already being built with that in mind which i think is fantastic so it doesn't need uh, a mediator to explain how it's work and people you need somebody very charming to put the headset on your head and tighten it at the back and press play. <laughs> regarding some royalty problem and it's kind of a new artist, how can you value so how many people can access to VR museum and how much we can pay for it, like exhibition or how can they sell their VR artwork? It's a very large it's very I let you answer because the moment it's a question which has no uh, answer which is you know, set in stone but it is like video art so Essentially, when you buy an artwork, you buy the rights to um, to distribute it. So, if you own a piece, you know you can lend it to museum shows, just like you would do with a piece of video art. And we, you know, we have uh, agreements with the artists, and many of them, you know, of course, are represented by their galleries. So, there's quite a tight um, contractual uh, agreement. Uh, of course, if you're a young artist and you produce something yourself, so if you're not working with a production company like ours or like somebody else's, then that's more tricky because you can you can copy you can copy anything. But there are certain legal ways already in virtual reality, and I know there are actually some art lawyers that are working with VR. I mean, I at least know now two who are starting to to work with that. So it's 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 a process which is gaining so much speed. And uh, already now, today, sitting here, you will have two VR pieces in one small space. And I think every year it's just going to get easier and easier. So there is a legal side already with VR. So you can turn to a lawyer. <laughs> and tomorrow is a blockchain, perhaps. And blockchain is the solution. Perhaps. <laughs> so I had a question about what you said before, about the thing that actually virtual like people are looking now for experience that's the, that's the tendency where the public is going right now so my question was um, what if 
the success of virtual reality is just a wow effect. I mean, people have never tried virtual reality before, so they're coming to see it. They're, they're coming to have the experience of it. But uh, as Richard said before, the content is something else. So what is your opinion about the difference uh, between the content and the container? I mean, what if people are coming more for the container than for the content? For both? For both. Okay. <laughs> no? Uh, <laughs> you know, it's fine. Uh, I, I think first, uh, we are in the world of experience. You know, uh, when people go to museum today, uh, they just stay five seconds. Do the idea of contemplation is less and less. I, I should say the reason why you go to museum. Uh, I was going to show a statistic. You know, uh, there was a, a, a survey made in the United States in 3,000 museums. Why do people go to museums? It's for fun. It's for fun. Uh, and uh, so today you can use you can use fun to bring education. It's educated. And you can do it through a tool like VR. I will take you a good, another example, which is for me very interesting. Um, it shows you the power of transforming an artwork. Let us, say, let us look at the music industry. People go to concerts. And uh, there, a lot of people now are going to concert. And more and more people are going to concert. And the artists are making their living out of concerts. You can stream the music. Okay. But where do people discover music? It's on YouTube. And on YouTube is not just music. It's the whole experience. It's music and the art. And I do believe that the art could bring this kind of experience which will make people be interested to experience the real world. I do believe, I do believe that if we bring the right content, okay, we can bring people to do something like this. This is my, my opinion. And especially with the young generation. This is my belief. <laughs> My hope, which we're thinking. Yeah, but it's like it's more, it's a full world, it's not just a transition. Uh, it's not just a YouTube platform when you try a piece of art in the air, it's a piece by, by itself. So, you yeah, it's okay no, no, if you do you know, if, no, I was speaking, for instance, in uh, I think the, the DSL virtual uh, museum, it's an interesting experience, and Karen can confirm it. We made the three versions of this museum in less than two years uh, because of uh, what Karen has done and showing the work. <coughs> the first one was I asked someone to make uh, he came to us to be true. People come to us because uh, they, they are they know that we are very digitally, shall say, uh, open. And uh, he came to us and, and he, we replicate the white cube and we put works inside. It was interesting, it was the gimmick of the container. Okay? But it was very boring. You know, and I felt very quickly, very frustrated, because I had to walk like I walk in a museum. Uh, and someone else came to us when we home and I said, okay, you want to do something for us? Only thing, I don't want any physical constraint. I want you to exploit the the power of VR. And they built a museum of 400 meters long, 40 meters high, where you can walk, where you can jump, where you can do a lot of things. It was very interesting because we show this in many places. And what we saw very quickly is that we had to go to another side if we wanted to reach especially the young people. It was to bring a kind of gamification inside. And so what we do? Some of the works, you can take them, show them, and so, and after, what is interesting, when you ask the children who spend 10 minutes, they can give you the names of all the artists. So, once again, uh, the artwork, 
even a nut in a museum can be put in a situation where it can bring, a, I shall say, a memorable experience or shall bring, I shall say, education and entertainment. This is the, what we have to do. Uh, the you want the painting is incredible. And you look at, I, mean, I really encourage you to, to look at the uh, you want. Uh, you, you see the power of an artist using, with a, always with a painter, and how she used this tool to give to a painting an incredible dimension. This is my, what I, I would like things to do. But storytelling. I know that's exactly what I wanted to ask. Um, you mentioned earlier, and I thought it was very interesting because you experienced it on your own, but it was very like reading a book. And so I wondered how important you felt the story part, a storytelling part of the art was as versus an immersive experience. Because it could just be an immersive experience or it can be an interactive storytelling experience. What, what do you feel about the differences? Well, I try, we try to, I think, at Cora, to move away from the word experience as much as possible because I think the artists also, they see it, and this also connects to your question, as an artwork in turn, right? And I think for, for me, what would be really great is when you have a retrospective of an artist, the VR piece will not longer be called a VR art. It will just be, you know, she's already gone by new mom. And there will not be the VR label on it because it's just part of their whole body of work. So, you know, of course, we'll have digital catalog resumes, not you know, written ones probably, where that work will be included. So, there is no, it's not something which enhances their, um, their other work, but it is a work in its own right. Um, and I think that. As you said, storytelling is very important. And for example, I mean, I watched, of course, your piece from beginning to end. And I also encourage, once you get used to having a headset in your head, to really go through the full artwork. Because if you, um, for example, see Paul McCarthy or Yu Hong, there is a beginning and an end. So there is always, there is a story, there is a climax. Of course, you can walk into the, the artwork in the middle and you know come out of it, and you will get a certain feeling to it. But the artist recreated with a certain thought behind it. Uh, you know, and, and it's not just and like entering a room and entering a space. That's completely different. So there, there is clearly, and you come out, I and mean, when, you, when you watch the, the 11 minutes of Paul McCarthy from the beginning to the end, you're sweating. You come out shivering, shaking. And I think this is what the artist is trying to, to, to make you understand. And they want this to come across, that feeling that you come out and think, whoa, that was really incredible, and that is that artist. And as you said, 30 years later, this will be part of uh, part of history. And I think connecting it to your question uh, is that the content and through the VR works, we will hopefully be able to attract a younger generation of visitors to then discover the other works of the artist. So once they've seen, they probably will come and see the VR first because it's something which attracts them, and then by then learning the name of the artist, they will then go and look at the sculptures, maybe by a catalogue, maybe read a book, or look up on the internet what that artist has done. So I think it's, it's, a, great, it's a great way to, for, for many different aspects, to attract new visitors and new collectors or new, you know, as you said, you know, the four-year-olds will be the, the, new, the new collectors of the art in the future. Great answer. Thank you very much. Any other questions? I have one. Okay, sorry. Like, no, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> no, sorry. Um, you talked a little bit about the Modigliani show and that VR experience there, which was a visit of his studio, essentially, a replica of his studio. And I'm curious to hear your thoughts about what will happen when and if VR does become a lot more common in institutions as artworks themselves. It will there be space for these experiences that aren't artworks, that are just enhancing an exhibition through other methods, in essence? Hugely, yes. I think. I mean, this is this is going to be a very, you know, our, our model is a very laborious one where you know we're really uh, building something up, and you know there there's there's hopefully a market which is growing. But I think the experience side. I mean, it's already you know Cora, for example, Cora Contemporary, you know, our sister company, 
where our two partners are coming from, Cora, they're, they're using VR in healthcare, for example, in old people's homes. Uh, you know, VR has been proven to help uh, rehabilitation of patients. So, and museums, as you said, you know, with that, with that Modigliani experience, I think we'll see much, much more of that. Uh, and not only in the art world, we'll see it in the natural history museums, we'll see it in, you know, so many different uh, institutions which attract the public around the world. I think that uh, if uh, you give us the chance to be here in five years, I think the discussion would be different. And I think uh, we have many, many things to tell, but you will see that uh, VR will be part of your life. We are away of your life. Just invite us in five years. We have other answers.